Years ago, a woman came to see me for help with an abusive marriage. She was an EMT who worked for a local ambulance service. She was smart and strong and emotionally tough. As with other clients in violent relationships, I took her through the standard services, a dangerousness assessment and a safety plan. These always led to the same recommendation to leave everything behind and go to a shelter. She didn't like that idea. Few victims did. The closest shelter was more than a 40 minute drive away and she had to be able to respond more quickly than that at her job. She had a different plan, a plan that didn't involve losing her job and adding a financial crisis to her marital one. Her plan involved money, something still seldom emphasized in counseling. She reckoned that in about six months, she could get her own apartment and start divorce proceedings if she was careful about saving her money. In the meantime, she'd work as much as possible and steer clear of her husband as best she could. And that's what she did, a very impressive woman. Now, when I look back to my encounter with her, the surprising aspect is not her pragmatic determination nor her commitment to making her community safer, even in the midst of her own crisis. Rather, the surprising part is how poorly my psychology training prepared me for that moment. She found a course of action that, even today, few psychologists would recommend. Psychology still doesn't recognize how common such experiences are or all the ways that people respond to them. That's resilience, all the things we do and all the help we get from others to overcome trauma. I wrote those words over a year ago when this TEDx University of the South event was originally scheduled for March 2020 before the pandemic interrupted it. In the original version of my talk, I next planned to gesture to the audience and ask them to consider how many in the room had experienced trauma. Even before the pandemic, I knew that the answer was probably all of us. Now, trauma is all around us, with people dying from COVID every minute. And that doesn't even include the trials of healthcare workers or the vulnerability and anxiety we've all experienced. The pandemic has added to our dose of trauma, which is the cumulative lifetime burden of all the adversities we've experienced. That dose will remain with us even when the pandemic is over. It's hard to talk about trauma, but now more than ever, we need to. Back when I was in graduate school, the only place I heard much about trauma was the student lounge. The cliche shared there was that everyone gets clinical training to figure out their own families. That was certainly one of the reasons I was there. I grew up in a home with depressed and alcoholic parents who likewise grew up in similar homes where they too experienced a lot of trauma. Even today, many in my extended family struggle with substance abuse and that often contributes to cascades of other traumatic experiences. For a long time, even years after grad school, my past made me feel different from other professionals. However, thanks to better data, I now know I'm not unusual. Most people in the United States and around the world experience trauma, which includes not only family dysfunction, but also bullying, discrimination, and other adverse experiences outside the family, including pandemics. As a psychology professor, I've been studying these issues for more than 20 years. On and around this mountain, my team and I have interviewed more than 4,000 people, and we found that more than eight in 10 experienced victimization, which includes such things like child abuse and community violence. If you count other losses, such as the death of a loved one, then the number was north of 98% even before the pandemic. Sooner or later, everyone experiences trauma. Or 
speaking as a parent, the sometimes even greater challenge of watching loved ones suffer. Even in countries with incredible social safety nets like Canada and Sweden, you see similar numbers. No society has figured out how to eliminate trauma. Now, I've been told that's a pretty bummer message, but I think that that's the wrong way to look at it because if trauma is common, then so is resilience. Take that EMT. I learned from her and so many others that there is extensive untapped wisdom about coping with trauma. Once you realize how common trauma is, it seems even stranger that we avoid talking about it. Psychologists are as bad as anyone about this, maybe worse. My professors hardly ever spoke about trauma, or if they did, they talked about it as if it was a rare and extreme experience. Maybe true for Vietnam vets, but not the rest of us. I can't recall a single professor or clinical supervisor ever disclosing a traumatic event from their own past. And because they never talked about anything bad happening to them, they also never shared what they did to cope with the bad things that must have happened. Even today, health professionals seldom publicly acknowledge their own trauma. But I often wonder, what would therapy look like if it was based on the ways that therapists cope with their trauma? Instead, what I learned in my clinical training is the importance of acting like you have your life completely together. Now, there are some good reasons for this. You don't want to seek psychological help from someone who looks like they're on the verge of a breakdown. I totally get that. You don't even want to watch a TED talk from someone who looks like they're on the verge of a breakdown. So here I am today practicing many of the skills I learned. I look pretty put together, don't you think? I did my hair and this is a new dress. But you can take that too far. If you pretend that you've never had a hair out of place in your whole life, you can lose empathy for those who are in crisis. They become the other. Even worse, our perfect professional personas make it harder for our clients to see pathways to resilience because it looks like you must avoid adversity to create a good life. Perhaps because of this pretending, psychologists used to treat resilient people like unicorns, remarkable and rare. But it turns out that resilient people are like squirrels. We're everywhere. Any group includes people who have overcome trauma, and many of the most accomplished people in the world have significant trauma histories. Instead of pretending that our lives are perfect, we should be wearing the traumas we survive like badges of honor. There's so much we can learn from people who have experienced high doses of trauma, but still manage to create good lives. So, I shifted the focus of my work to understanding the wisdom of resilient people. By this time, I had come to this mountain, not far from where my parents grew up. Rural Appalachians, like trauma victims, are often described in highly negative and stereotyped terms. But as far as I was concerned, I thought this mountain was a great place to study surviving and even thriving after trauma. Many communities in this region don't have a lot of financial wealth, but they have other, more important kinds of wealth. Using focus groups, interviews, and surveys, my team and I work to identify the underappreciated strengths of resilient people. If you create a safe space, then people are willing and even eager to share their stories. I met a 16-year-old boy who was bullied a lot when he was younger. His solution was to join the football team where he eventually rose to be co-captain. Work, work, work is what he told me, day in and day out. When I met him, he and his teammates were at the weight room on a hot summer's day. The rest of the school was deserted, but there they were working together. No one bullies him anymore and he found his purpose mentoring other students. I've found that a sense of purpose is the most important ingredient for resilience. 
he also found two other important ingredients, a healthy routine and a supportive group of peers. People around here also use humor to cope. One focus group of parents joked so much about mistreating their kids that I worried that an outsider reading the transcript would think they were disclosing real child abuse. But they were laughing so hard, along with my interns and me, that I didn't have the heart to ask them to stop. Those parents had all experienced a lot of childhood trauma, and they could have bragged that they were proud to break the cycle. Instead, they cracked jokes that powerfully communicated the contrast between their own childhoods and the lives they had created for their families. Thanks to them, we now ask about humor and have found that is another key resilience skill. Save money. Exercise, join an organization, crack jokes to lighten the dark times, connect to something larger than yourself, whether it's parenting, supporting peers, or making your community safer. Perhaps these are familiar to you because they're what many people do to overcome trauma. These are the kinds of things I did to overcome my own traumatic experiences, including being here today where I'm working on my purpose to help reduce the burden of trauma. The science is finally starting to catch up to this community wisdom, showing that exercise, volunteering, and many other activities help with depression and anxiety just as much as psychotherapy and drugs. Purpose and stability and connection can help us create good lives despite all the unavoidable pain. Think about the people you know. Yes, those are faces who've suffered trauma, but those are also faces of resilience. Our traumatic experiences are important parts of who we are. They never really go away, and we must come to terms with acknowledging them. However, trauma is not the most important thing about you. The most important thing is what happened next, what you did to make it to today. It took scientists a long time to appreciate the importance of trauma dose, the wear and tear on our bodies and minds that happens when bad things pile on and add up. Now, science is finally starting to realize that dose is important for resilience too. You can pile on and add up the good stuff, whether it's your own strengths or the help you get from family, friends, and community. The latest science suggests that higher doses of good things can counteract even large doses of trauma. In the post-pandemic era, this insight will be more important than ever. When I look out on this room today, I see strength. Resilient fellow speakers and organizers who helped make this event happen despite the pandemic. If you are watching this, I hope you appreciate what you've done to make it to today and that you will take a chance and find a safe space to share your story. Because I believe that only sharing the truth about trauma and the ways we overcome trauma is the path to a better world. There are a lot of your fellow squirrels out there and I think they would be glad to meet the whole you. Thank you.